Governor Uba Sani of Kaduna State has received the abducted school children from Kuriga after 16 days of being in captivity. The general officer commanding one division of the Nigerian army while handing over the rescued children to the governor at the government state house in Kaduna says that 137 children were rescued but 131 was physically present while the remaining six were still undergoing medical care at a military facility in the state. Mavalos Obomanu was at the government house in Kaduna and now reports. It was almost termed a rumor or mere speculation when the military announced the rescue of the 138 kidnapped school children in Kuriga, located in Chikum local government area of Kaduna State. Parents and stakeholders concerned waited anxiously for the arrival. They are here present this afternoon and also at one division medical services and hospital. A total of 137 students of the government's secondary and local education authority primary schools, Kuriga, in Chukun local government area of Kaduna State. Today, to the glory of God, all the children abducted are here back safely. The general officer commanding one division, Nigerian Army, Kaduna, accompanied by other military and paramilitary agencies in the state, arrived with the rescued victims, revealing that both kinetic and non-kinetic approaches were adopted in the rescue operation. Meanwhile, the governor of the state criticized those asking for the specifics of the rescue operation, saying they should be contended with the rescue of the children and their safe return back to their families. The abducted Kuriga school children have, over in the early hours of yesterday, Sunday, 24th March, 2020, safely rescued after spending about 16 days in captivity. The students were initially received and administered first aid at the Nigerian Army Troops Forward Operating Base at Tansadao Forest in Zampara State. I want to also caution our insecurity merchants and complete merchants in Nigeria to be cautious with our transits. Since the return of my children in the last few two days or oh, yesterday evening when I was able to visit them. A lot of people have been spending a lot of time coming with permutations on how these children were released, what happened. For us in Kaduna, what is more important is the safe returns of our children. We're happy they're here with us. That is more important. During the handover ceremony, we observed that no parent was on ground to receive their words and no information was given for this. In Kaduna for News Central, I am Marvelous Oboman. In the meantime, the federal government of Nigeria insisted that no ransom was paid for the release of the abducted Kuriga children in Kaduna State. The Minister of Information, Mohamed Idris, who briefed State House correspondents after the Federal Executive Council meeting, said the victims secured their freedom through the concerted efforts of security agencies in the country. He said the Nigerian armed forces are upping their game and have developed a new strategy to ensure the security of every Nigerian. President uh, and members of council are happy to note that uh, as promised by Mr. President, these children were reunited or have been rescued from these captives. And as usual, and in keeping with the commitment of Mr. President, no ransom was paid. We are very grateful to the Federal Executive Council and Mr. President, very grateful to especially the National Security Advisor, the service chiefs, and all security agents who participated diligently in ensuring that these kidnapped children are united with their families. 
government is determined to ensure that uh, the lives and property of all Nigerians are protected at all time. And Mr. President has also charged security agencies to ensure that these kidnappings are brought to a halt finally in this country. Indeed, all those who are participating in this criminal act will be fished out by the security agencies and will never go unpunished. Still with security matters in Nigeria, the federal government there says it has invited Kaduna-based Islamic cleric, and that's a sheikh, Ahmed Gumi, over his comments on the activities of bandits in the country. Now, this was disclosed by the Minister of Information and Orientation, Mohammed Idris, on Monday while addressing journalists at the State House, Abuja. Idris said Gumi is not above the law, noting that the government has deemed it necessary to invite him for questioning. The cleric had earlier offered to dialogue with bandits who abducted the school children from Kuriga Government Secondary and LEA Primary Schools in the Chinko local government area of the state. According to him, Tunumbu must not repeat the mistake made by former President Muhammadu Buhari, who refused to dialogue with bandits. And joining me now to discuss this further is public affairs analyst Catch Ononuju. Ononuju. And uh, Catch, let me say happy midday to you. Good afternoon to you. Catch, are you there? I'll try to make that connection. Uh, catch. We're going to move on. We'll try to make the connection with Catch in our subsequent bulletins. But still on security matters, Nigeria has been marred with insecurity in the last few years, leading to the death of thousands of people and displacement of many in different regions of the country. Now, during a gathering of reporters attending the launch of the book, Anything and Everything Journalism, the role of media in surveillance and sensitization was emphasized as a key tool to help tackle insecurity issues. New Central's Bettina Nguyeli reports. The media has been accused of contributing to the worsening state of insecurity and conflict in Nigeria due to their pattern of reportage, which primarily aims at maximizing profit by manipulating the audience. More worrisome is the fact that insurgents mainly seek first and foremost to manipulate and explore the media for their own selfish purposes by sending out messages that will increase their publicity. Something that should inspire journalists uh, to be more focused on their passion, to be more critical about the elements, um, the finesse that goes into, into their craft. And I think much more importantly, to be able to build um, a new, what I'll call a new crop of journalists um, that will build a sustainable future for the profession. Even in the developed world, even in England, in America, if anything happens, even to the president, you can see that the um, Princess of Wales, she had cancer and it was announced. The Prince of Wales, the king. You see, the point is that we must always allow people to be informed. If you don't give information to Nigerians, then you are forced to allow them to start carrying unnecessary rumors. Speaking on the spate of kidnap and insecurities in the country, Dakuku Peterside had this to say about the role of the media. If media practitioners are professionally trained and are thoroughbred professionals, nothing, nothing can come as a barrier between them and doing their duty. Even in the United States, it is not government that will give media access. Media will have access one way or the other. And now particularly to the insecurity going on in our country, there ought to be some form of collaboration between security personnel and journalists or the media. Now, who fosters this collaboration? It could be either the military or the uh, media. What matters most importantly is the fact that if people understand the critical role the media can play in addressing insecurity, the media will obviously offer you the platform. About quality, about delivering good service, isn't it? Journalism as an industry faces a lot of challenges in Nigeria but as long as the government and media fail to mitigate terrorist exploitation of the new media, things may persist. Analysts say 
the media should deliberately work to improve upon its performance criteria so as to restore confidence in the hearts of the people. In Lagos, for New Central, Bettina Nguyen. Um, Still on insecurity, earlier we th told you that the federal government of Nigeria says it has invited Kaduna-based uh, cleric, and that is uh, Sheikh Ahmed Gumi. Joining me now to have a discussion more is uh, the uh, public affairs analyst, Katch Ononuju. Katch, are you back on now? Can, we, can you hear me? Catch, are you there? Yes, I am. I'm uh, there. there you are. Fantastic. Let's get started, shall we? The popular Kaduna uh, cleric, Ahmed Gumi, has been uh, speaking in support of bandits and uh, you know, terrorists in recent times and asking and calling for, uh, so for him to be sort of a middleman in negotiations and dialogue. What do you make of this as uh, many consider it a criminal offense, or is it uh, protected by uh, freedom of expression? Well, thank you. I think the problem about uh, Sheikh Gumi offer a time warp problem. This was what he was doing under the Buhari administration. And because Buhari condoned it, he continued. As Tinubu came in, he warned Tinubu that if Tinubu does not negotiate with him, that his voice will go on. Tinubu, in the heat of that, published names of terrorists, and among those names was his Assistant Manu Tukro. He got angry, but then Tinibu had continued to say that he would not negotiate with him. Whether you like it or not, Gumi is a terrorism enabler and a terrorism sympathizer. He sees it as a business. Well, catch, catch, are you there? We have lost him, but just a bit to understand that our analysts form their own opinions. That's not, it doesn't represent the opinion here at News Central. We give you the news and we speak to the analysts and their views is that, that, that dares alone. Catch, are you there? And while we try to make the connection, you're watching News Central now. We'll go on a short break. Catch, I understand you're back. Are you back on now? We'll go on a short break. Stay with us. Don't go anywhere. Let's still focus on Nigeria and this time to the news of Binance as it continues to unfold. The federal government has initiated international efforts to apprehend Nadim Anjawala, a key executive of Binance who escaped custody on Friday. Anjawala, a suspect in the probe into Binance's activities in Nigeria, reportedly fled using a Kenyan passport, evading security measures in place. Security agencies were left stunned by the escape, especially considering Ajawala was held in a secure location, guarded by soldiers. Sakari Mijiyawa, head of strategic communication at the Office of the National Security Advisor, underscored ongoing efforts to apprehend the fugitive and investigate the circumstances surrounding his escape. He noted that those responsible for his custody have been detained pending further investigations. Still on Binance, the Nigerian government on Monday initiated proceedings against the company, which is a cryptocurrency exchange platform, over tax evasion. The Federal Inland Revenue Service filed the charges at the Federal High Court in Abuja. The move is aimed at upholding fiscal accountability and safeguarding the nation's economic integrity. The lawsuit alleges that Binance failed to meet its tax obligations, including non-payment of value-added tax, company income tax, and failure to file tax returns. Additionally, the company is accused of aiding customers in evading taxes through its platform. The FIRS emphasizing that platform, that Binance, I beg your pardon, failure to register for tax purposes and comply with Nigerian tax laws constitutes a violation of legal requirements. And now to discuss this further, I am joined by Head of Operations, Coin Coin Exchange, and that's Tayo Omidiron. Tayo, uh, let's get started, shall we? Uh, first of all, thank you so much for coming on. Now, the charges against Binance, it include non-payment of value-added tax, company income tax, and also failure to file uh, tax returns. But 
can these be paid since it's never you know had a fiscal uh, presence in Nigeria? It's just a digital platform performing, you know, doing business everywhere. Hi, um, good afternoon. Thanks for having me. Um, yes, uh, Binance should pay tax, especially the value-added tax, because they are providing uh, goods and services. Um, you you don't have to have a physical presence to be able to be charged for tax, as long as you're providing service. I mean, with the, you can correlate this with the issue of Twitter, when um, Twitter, I had to pay some uh, tax and levies for protein in Nigeria. It happens all over the world. Um, they, they have to be taxed as long as they are making uh, benefits from um, the Nigerian uh, citizens. Mm. And also, let's uh, just put into uh, focus here that the charge that Binance is, uh, uh, one of the charges is that Binance is, you know, complicit in aiding customers to evade taxes through its platform. Now, would Nigeria need the aid of the United States, uh, maybe, to enforce this and other claims? Yes, um, it's it's very funny that um, the issues Binance is having in Nigeria is quite peculiar with um, the issues Binance had with the United States of America. Um, most of the charges against them are um, the weak anti-money laundry um, system, um, lack of KYC, and um, the, they didn't report any suspicious activities, and which is similar to what um, Nigeria is charging Binance with arbitrage, um, data protection. So, of course, um, Nigeria can, um, can look at um, the, the is similar issues with um, the United States of America and take a cue from them because the, the, the situations and the um, charges are very, very similar between both countries. So, definitely, uh, the federal government of Nigeria would do a wise thing by um, reaching out to the United States. Hmm. And now you said that, you know, this is not the first time. It's very similar with, you know, their runnings with the United States. But will Binance pay outright, you know, or would they negotiate a sort of, you know, settlement? So let's try to project what will most likely happen. Or would they just call it quits since it has stopped operating in Nigeria? What are, what's your opinion on this? So the, the Binance CEO um, got charged $4 billion for as retribution for his case with the United States. While in Nigeria, we charged him $10 billion. Uh, Personally, I feel that's um, a bit far-fetched. But like you suggested, um, there will probably be negotiations and Binance will definitely pay, I believe, uh, similar to what they have agreed to pay in the United States, about $4 billion to $5 billion. Because to be fair, they've made a lot of profits operating in Nigeria. Nigeria, again, has similar markets to the United States. We have about 33 million users um, who are interested in crypto. So uh, user appetite and investment appetite is quite high in Nigeria. So Binance would definitely uh, make good to make some of the payments. Probably not the whole 10 billion, but um, it would be wise for them to make the payments and then we apply to operate in Nigeria because... Nigeria has a large market, second largest market in the world after the United States for cryptocurrency and Bitcoin. Tayo Omidiron, he's the head of operations Coin Coin Exchange. Tayo, thanks so much for coming on and giving us some insights on this story. Thanks. We'll move away from that now to Nigeria's federal government as it says that it is set to conduct a comprehensive census of the nation's education sector to help plan properly for its growth. Nigeria's Minister of Education made this known during a two-day capacity building training for desk officers of the ministry, including its departments, agencies, and tertiary institutions, saying that the current challenges affecting the sector will require proper data for planning. The role that education plays in the national development of a nation cannot be overemphasized. However, with poor educational infrastructure, inadequate classrooms, and teaching aids, among other challenges. Not enough data is available for effective planning to improve the nation's educational sector. And engaging and working together with our IT people 
to generate data on schools, all schools in Nigeria. If you saw the background of the Kuriga school, you would want to cry. It's not a very good sight to see. Now, that data will help us advise the state governors who are in charge of those schools, the conditions of those schools, so that they can move in and do the right thing. The data on teachers will help us know teachers to the ratio in every state, every local government, in every school. While the minister also expressed concerns over poor teaching methods affecting students' ability to assimilate at the pre-tertiary level of education, development partners present pledged to support efforts aimed at tackling this challenge by bridging funding gaps. There's a report that just came out by the uh, is it EPA and RD about students or people at levels two and three finding it difficult even to identify numbers and letters. But how can we come in? We can only come in when we have the necessary data. Because zones could differ, states could differ, schools could even differ. Uh, our strategy is to make sure that the fi uh, international financing, the technical assistance, the best practice from around, around the world is available. This capacity building training workshop focused on implementation, collation, harmonization and reporting of ministerial deliverables. The minister tasked participants to collaborate and help restore the glory of the nation's educational sector. In Abuja for New Central, I am Idonk Joseph. And I'll move on to food security as concerns are simmering in Nigeria. Soaring farmland cost is squeezing out smallholder farmers, the lifeblood of the nation's agricultural sector. Now, compounding this challenge is the specter of insecurity with violence dis disrupting farming activities and casting a shadow over food production. Now, to discuss this further, I am joined by a founder, uh, Oluwa Kwelumi uh, Oladapo. Uh, Oluwa Kwelumi, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Can you help me say your company name so I don't butcher it? Fenolosis Integrated Services. Fantastic. All right, so let's get started, right? The World Food uh, Program, WFP, just disputed that over 785 million people globally do not have enough food and over 47 million people in 54 countries, including Ethiopia, Yemen, South uh, Sudan, and even parts of northern Nigeria, uh, at an emergency level, a uh, worse grips of, uh, of uh, farming. Now, this must be scary, or in fact, it is very scary. But how did we even get here to begin with? First of all, um, we lack direction, or we, we will last say the leadership lack uh, will to prosecute this. So that is how we get here. Uh, we take farming or agree as a leisure, not as a business or as a career. Mm -hmm. I can remember back in secondary school, you just have farm practical and you just everybody just go to farm and there is no reward after you eat whatever the labor is. So there is no reward after this. So that's a whole lot of issue. And some of us see farming as a way of being enslaved or an ad labor. So there is no way whereby you want to say, oh, let me go ahead and invest in farming or let me try and develop a career in farming. But nowadays, I believe individuals are taking a lot of uh, new, innovative, and taking it forward. We are bringing in technology into farming. So I think uh, we can do much more if the government should create like a school program and, a bu and see the agricultural industry as a business and as a career. Uh, young people will have interest in it because I believe the way you wire their thinking matter most a lot. So if this can be done, we could have a, 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 a world whereby there will be sufficient food in later years to come. So, so capture the youth and change the mindset uh, of the youth towards agriculture, right? Um, but this is urgent, okay? This is a matter of urgency uh, in terms of, you know, 
farming and the number of people and the part of Africa and even part of Nigeria that's at stake here when it comes to tackling you know, food uh, security. So what must be done urgently to address you know, or arrest this trend? Firstly, the, the government needs to come up with a law whereby we could provide farmland for people to farm and also provide implement. I'm not talking of tractor or giving oats. I'm talking of providing modern technology to farm. And also the government to also encourage people that are already in need uh, could provide a storage facility for them whereby people could store their tomatoes, for example, store their iwidu, store their vegetables, store, I mean, a storage facility and a processing facility should be provided. If this is well done, the government could also create a I mean, should have an emergency roadmap uh, whereby they could uh, give a soft loan, not just giving soft loan, but monitor uh, how this money is being distributed and how it's been implemented. Several loans has been given several times and does not bring forth any results. At the end of it, that is how we find ourselves here. I think the government must be ready to have a will. Right. They will first then have the mindset and the technocrats to implement this strategy. Technocrats are really important because they are the stakeholders in changing the trend that we see. Many thanks to you, Ulua Balumi, for coming on. Appreciate you for doing this with us. My pleasure. Thank you so much. This, uh, Central Now. We'll take a short break. When we come back on the other side more, then go anywhere. And we continue New Central Now in Senegal, where Basiru Duomaye Faye is in his, in his first public appearance since securing the presidency, has expressed his firm commitment to steering Senegal in a new direction. Faye emphasized that his election victory symbolized a decisive break from the existing political order, signaling a desire for change among the Senegalese people. Addressing concerns about international relations, Faye reassured foreign partners that Senegal would remain a steadfast and trustworthy ally for nations seeking constructive and respectful collaboration. He pledged to foster virtuous and mutually beneficial partnerships while upholding Senegal's interest on the global stage. In a consolatory gesture, Faye spoke of his intention to mend divides within Senegalese society, emphasizing the need to unite hearts and minds for the nation's collective well-being. He promised to diligently work towards fulfilling the aspirations kindled by his election, striving to translate promises into tangible progress for the Senegalese populace. And now to further discuss this, I am joined by Executive Director Not Too Young to Lead Initiative, and that's Amb Ambassador Elvis Akbobi. Ambassador, uh, it's good to have you join me. Uh, let's get started, shall we, very quickly. What factors do you believe contributed to the electoral process of uh, FIRE? He's a relatively young candidate at 44 years old. I would say it's, it's kind of mid-age, it's not too young, though. And in the recent, uh, uh, it, just in the recent Senegalese you know, presidential elections, what are your thoughts? Um, I'm overwhelmed with joy and I'm excited that um, what the Not Too Young Police stands for, what we are advocating for is coming to play and is overwhelming the entire West Africa. We can't have um, it um, immediately, but we're having it gradually. What happened in Senegal, Equal to the previous, this last election shows that um, politics and power is gradually going back to the people. The people spoke with their vote. They demonstrated who they wanted to, you know, steer the ship of their country with their vote. And a young man who has been advocating for the need of the people, a young man who believes in steering the ship, uh, making policies that will better their, its people, was elected. And um, from his first speech, he said, he wants, he wants to, you know, do a lot of changes. And from what I see, he will, he will get it right as a mm. president. And, and very, very bold and strong speech there. And, uh, you know, it's, uh, it tilts towards um, what we hope for for Senegal. And now all eyes are on him and also on Senegal as well. Because, I mean, the statements that was made there in his, uh, in his speech there was very, very profound. Well, I mean, one can ask and even wonder how significant his victory would also mean in terms of um, a desire for change, not only within the Senegalese po uh, political landscape, but also West Africa at large. I mean, take Nigeria for one. 
your your thoughts on that? Uh, I think um, what happened is, uh, in Senegal is a testament of um, change that happened anywhere. And uh, I think uh, Nigerians to borrow a leaf from it, that um, power belongs to the citizens and not the people we contract governance to with our votes. The bleakness we're faced with today as Nigerians, it's, uh, it's caused by people who contracted governance to with our votes, but who can make that change with our votes anytime election line comes up. And another thing that is key again in this previous election is within, really, I noticed because I have right. someone on ground there, I was meant to understand that the military, the security men, yeah. they did not interfere with the election and, and not forgetting that they have, it's, at the moment, I can at you guys say, I think I have um, the headquarter of um, a transparent democracy in the Senegal at the moment. I can boldly say that. And I think other West African countries should borrow leave from that. Yeah. I mean, now you, you one of the things that uh, that uh, is very you know obvious, and, and I mean, that was also sort of uh, hinted on by, by President Macky Sall and also all of the international, but, and everyone who's been observing the electoral process even before and, you know, the campaigning process was that fire was fires, you know, status as an anti-establishment candidate. And that seems to be very synonymous with the narrative when it comes to younger candidates. Um, but what challenges might he face in implementing his proposed reforms and, and policies? Um, he, in his speech, he talked about the, the young man at the moment is faced with, you know, policy reforming, um, creating jobs for young people who are mostly the larger populace and um, their, bilater their bilateral relationships with other Western countries. Well, he needs to create another thing against foreign direct investment into the, that country. But people, statistics and people, opinions have it that he's not experienced owing to the fact that he's yet to you know, hold an elective position before now, he, but he has been an activist before now. I was meant to understand that he's a tax, um, it's into a tax operator. But my, my, the confidence I have is he has the likes of um, Mr. Sanko, who is well experienced, and other opposition leaders with him. And if he, if he borrow a leaf from their experience and not take all the advice they give to him, but advice is that makes Seliga better, I think he will do it as a president. And one thing he must bear in mind is his actions and inactions. As a young, as one of the first elected young presidents in West Africa, we had our open doors for other young presidents across West Africa. So we're looking forward to him doing well. We're going to support him at the civil society organizations, and I will pray he takes uh, Senegal to a greater height. Ambassador, I mean, you just made very solid points there uh, when it comes to his governance or what he will be for his administration. But one thing is certain, a solid team and a solid start is all that really matters to Stair Senegal uh, and the way forward. Ambassador, thank you so much for coming on. We appreciate you for doing this with us. Thank you for having me. And that's Ambassador Elvis Akwobi. He is the executive director, Not Too Young to Lead initiative. And he was talking to us about the recent win of FAE uh, president-elect for Senegal.